Um, so it's a pleasure to be here in Oslo, uh, Norway. I've never been to Oslo before, so uh, it's been an, an interesting and engaging experience already. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me. The title of my talk is We Don't Need No Educator. Normally my titles are more grammatically correct, but uh, we're sort of going with the theme here. The subtitle is The Role of the Teacher in Today's Online Education. And the thesis essentially is that the role of the teacher as we know it will kind of vanish and disappear. But the bulk of the talk is about what will replace the teacher because of course education will not vanish and disappear and no robots are not going to come out of nowhere and start teaching us. That's almost certainly not going to happen. I have to say almost because you never know. I saw those Honda robots in Japan dancing a jig. So. But no, uh, this talk is not to propose that teachers will be replaced with robots or anything like that. But teachers will be replaced with a wide variety of people. And that's what I want to talk about today. Now, let's put this in context. And I, I, I like to do a lot of context setting before I give a talk. That scene, of course, is from Pink Floyd, The Wall. And I really, really wanted to start the talk, especially with the title the way it is, with Pink Floyd playing in the background, maybe on, but I get into copyright trouble if I did that, because I do try to record these. But what's interesting, and there have been a lot of comments, you know, a lot of uh, things written uh, in my notes, I've got some references and these will be available later. People saying that the single most important factor affecting student achievement is the teacher. And you know, I, I look at something like that and of course all the teachers in the room nod, but I don't think it's true. Uh, I think even today when we examine what in fact impacts educational outcomes and there are studies and studies and studies looking at these factors. Numerous factors. Parental income is a major factor. It's probably the major predictor of educational outcome is parental income as opposed to teachers. Socioeconomic factors, expectations in societies, role models in societies, uh, social equity. It, from the, if you look at the PISA data, for example, that's the uh, student assessment that OECD does, there is a correlation between equity in society and student achievement in that society. Even if the society itself is poorer, the difference between rich and poor makes a difference. And of course, there's the genetic predisposition uh, it is arguable, although I'd be hard pressed to make the argument that some people are born geniuses, others not so much. Certainly childhood nutrition plays a huge factor here. I personally think that everybody can achieve, every person has the capacity to achieve, but many things happen to people on the way. Uh, their mother smokes, they don't get enough food. Uh, the social environment doesn't support them, the resources aren't available, and all of this can happen before they even enter school for the first time. The point here is, there's a lot going on in an education besides what happens between the teacher and the student. And if you look through, you know, through history, and if you look at learning today, we, we see dramatic changes in the traditional role. As I said, the, the thesis of the talk is that the traditional role of the educator is practically disappearing. So let me set this up. Let me set the objectives of the talk. That's for the teachers who like the objectives. Uh, and I, I want to do this as a threefold task. I, I, wanted to be Buddhist and do an eightfold noble path, but I thought three would be enough for an hour talk. The first thing I want to do is I want to pull apart 
the roles of the educator in an online world. I want to draw out all these different roles that are replacing the role of the teacher. And as we go through these, you will see the necessity of each one of these roles. But secondly, I want to actually show how these roles have been playing a real part in real online learning and in this way give you a bit of a tour of the massive open online course that George Siemens, Dave Cormier and I have been running for, well, since September and similar courses that we've been running since 2008. These are online courses, but they're not traditional classes held online. They're massive, they're open. Our current course has more than 2,100 participants, and these sorts of numbers are common. There's a, a course being held in Stanford had 200,000 participants. This, or something like this, is the shape of learning in the future as well, and I want you to see that. And then thirdly, I want to punctuate all of that with some sound practical examples and applications so that if you're interested in doing this sort of thing yourself, you have at least some starting points. So that's the plan. It's a very ambitious plan. Um, sometimes these ambitions pl ambitious plans don't work, but I'm gonna do my best. And uh, I've got, what, two hours you said? <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, do feel free if you want. And now we do have a panel discussion afterwards, so there, there will be lots of time for discussion. But if you have a, a pressing need to ask a question, to, to raise a comment, challenge me on something, do feel free to do so. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to have people converse during the, uh, during the presentation. You'll have to speak very loud because they're recording and all of that. And I don't know how they'll do that. There must be a microphone or something circulating somewhere. Maybe nobody planned for that? Somebody planned for that. <laughs> oh, then, yeah, there is a microphone. That's right. Okay. So now, what I'm describing really is a historical trend, isn't it? You know, way back in prehistory, you know, before computers, uh, we had teachers in schoolhouses and they did everything themselves. But as time went on, as more and more people began to be educated, as education itself became more institutionalized, we began to see the role of the teacher break apart into several sub-roles. And I've got four examples here. I could probably have listed more. We have now the school custodian who takes over many of the roles that the teacher used to play, making sure that the building is heated, that the plumbing works, etc. We have the school librarian who's taking over the custody of the books and the notes and the accounts uh, of that school. We have the school administrators who ma manage the funding, take care of hiring, firing, all of that sort of thing act as an interface between the teacher and the town, necessarily so for each side. And of course, we have tech support, or I, I tried to find a picture of the, of the AV coordinator. The, uh, that's the person who wheeled around the overhead projector. Uh, you know, so the, these roles have already begun to, I, I keep wanting to say decompose, but it's totally the wrong word. But you know, they've, they've split off from the traditional teacher. But even now, we still have a teacher. But again, this is going to change more and more into the future. Teachers themselves will be doing different kinds of things, and then other people will be doing other things. Now, I want to set this in a context, because like I said, I do lots of context setting. We haven't actually started the talk yet. I'm still setting context. Uh, that'll take 45 minutes, and then the last 15 minutes will be the talk. Uh, the, the context, of course, is online learning, okay? I'm not talking about your existing teachers in your existing schools, because somebody will, 
guaranteed uh, somebody will come along and say, well, that's not what's happening in my school now. And no, that's not what's happening in your school now. This is the context of learning of the future. It's the context of learning where we've migrated from a model of learning where the educator is the expert, the content deliverer, the knower of all things, the transmitter of information, the adjudicator of quality. We're moving beyond that role. We're, we're moving beyond the idea that learning is about acquiring some kind of content and stuffing it in your head. This is learning where we become, we learn by becoming something. We learn by acquiring skills and capacities. We learn by doing and by creating. This is learning where the learning takes place in, uh, the slide says, an authentic environment, which is a bit of a cliche, but learning takes place in an environment consistent with the type of learning that is taking place. Forestry is learned in a forest. Law is learned in a courtroom. Mechanics is learned in a machine room. Electricity is learned wherever electricians work. I don't know where electricians work. Uh, you get the idea. And learning consists of performing real world tasks in real world environments. And learning is a process of engagement. It's a process of connecting. It's a process of collaboration, experimentation, and exploration. And all of this, as I mentioned, in this online environment. But again, let me be clear. When I say online environment, I don't mean like 30 people seated at desks looking into a computer. An online environment means any environment where learning can be supported by a computer. And when I say online, instead of thinking of putting computers in the classrooms, I think of liberating people from the classrooms and, and doing what used to be done in the classroom with the computer with mobile access. I was looking because I don't understand Norwegian. So while the previous speaker was speaking, I was looking around and I see everybody with iPads and things like that. And that's the sort of thing that I mean. It's being connected, but being somewhere else. Although, of course, we're all kind of in this room, which is old style, but well, we'll get past that. So, and here's the course that I was talking about, uh, Change 2011. And uh, there's the, the URL. You'll see those URLs in the nice, neat little gray box throughout this presentation. Uh, these slides will all be available later, so you don't need to copy it down if you don't want to. But if you do really want to, if you want to go look at the course while I'm talking, because it's more interesting, by all means, please feel free. Although if you're using an iPad, you probably can't multitask your note taking anyhow. <laughs> So let me think about these roles. And again, this is the practical experience. The, the practical experience of doing these courses in an online environment. And, and those of you who teach online are going to be able to relate to this. Even though I'm talking about this massive open online course, a lot of these things are going to be reflected in almost any kind of online learning environment. In fact, when I was first working in the field of online learning, I used to talk a lot about something called a triad model. A triad model I stole from somewhere. and In fact, I've forgotten where I've stolen it from. But it's certainly not unique to me. But the model, it was originally intended to support distance learning. And then it was adapted to online learning. Basically sees three roles. The first role is of the learner, him or herself. Then you have the, the subject matter expert or the teacher, usually at a distance. Because you know, when I was doing this, I was working in northern, uh, northern Canada with First Nations communities. And the, the subject matter experts would be living in the large cities in the south and in the east. So they would typically be at a distance. And then the third part, which we found absolutely necessary in these kind of environments, was somebody on the ground, locally, working hand in hand with the students, taking these courses at a distance. I think of the Sunrise Project in Slave Lake, for example, 
um, or, or Blue Quills in St. Paul. Both of these are in northern Alberta. Uh, a, a mentor, a coach, a facilitator, somebody who, when the student didn't show up in the morning, they actually did this, would go down to the student's house, knock on their door and say, how come you're not you know, in school taking your classes <coughs> online? And then because of the complexity of the online environment, I've added a fourth major kind of role, the teacher as designer. So those are the four major overall categories, and I think those carry over to this day. Now, that's four roles, but as we're going to see, each of those roles is going to break out into a number of different, all fundamentally important, but all very different, very challenging roles. So let's look at the first set of roles. Oh, dang. I, I wanted to do something, sorry, I'm just thinking I wanted to do a little more design on those slides. That's not supposed to be so stark white, that little box. I was going to actually put a little box, a shading box over top of it a little off and then make it transparent. Anyhow, so pretend that that white box actually has a nice shaded, you know, about a 20% screen orange reddish screen over top of it so it's not glaring white but you can still see it easily so just anyhow so let's look at this first group the first group is teacher as learner and it's that's not a new concept i mean uh you know how how many teacher movies have we seen where the teacher says you know uh, i learn as much from you my students as, as you learn from me I mean this in a bit of a different sense. Teacher as learner is an actual functional role of teacher as teacher. Teacher as learner is necessary because while it used to be the case that you could learn a bunch of stuff and then go teach it, now things change so dramatically year over year that if you're not learning on a regular basis, you're going to fall behind and, and be a, a worse and worse teacher as time goes by. But also, too, I'm thinking of teacher as a model or paradigm or archetypal learner. Teacher as a person who learns in the presence of other learners so that those learners can see how to learn. And I think that's a really important role. I think this modeling role is probably more important than the actual teaching role. And in fact, you'll find that very little of the roles that I have to talk about today are actual teaching, projecting kind of roles. And mostly they're doing stuff like this kind of roles in a way that people can see what you're doing. Sorry about the bad grammar there. I really should tighten that up a bit. So let's look at those. Here's the first of the roles. The actual real life roles, and that's the teacher as collector. And this is a role that has reflected my own <laughs> practice. I think it reflects the practice of pretty much any teacher, if you, even the teachers that are in a classroom. It's the idea of a person who collects, who gathers, who aggregates. Today, we do that in a high powered, tech enabled way. <laughs> What I have pictured there is an application called Google Reader. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Google Reader? Oh my, five, six, ten, a few more? Or a whole bunch of very shy people in this room? It's always hard to judge. <laughs> Google Reader is fantastic. What Google, and, and there are some other uh, what are called RSS readers, but Google Reader is the most popular of them, although they've just redesigned it. You can see it looks pretty ugly now. It used to look really nice, and uh, I should have used the old version, but I can't. Um, but what it does is it aggregates or brings together content from multiple authors and multiple sources online. I use Google Reader to keep track of several hundred content sources people who write about the field of education, education technology, magazines, academic journals, organizations uh, such as ADL, Educause, and others, and anything else that takes place online related to educational technology. You can actually get, if you wanted, a list 
of all the feeds, all these sources that I use in Google Reader, if you went to <coughs> this URL, and it's kind of small, it's www.downs.ca slash opml.xml. That should work. And what that brings up is a file in a language called opml. And if you just open it in your browser, it's going to be a whole bunch of squiggles and be almost unreadable. But save it to your computer. And then when you go into Google Reader and you go into the Manage Feeds section, you can import an OPML file like that. And so what you could do is in your Google Reader account, you could get a duplicate, a duplicate copy of all the feeds that I read. And of course, if you're using Google Reader, you can export an OPML file to share with other people as well. So we've got two things on the go here, right? We've got feeds, which are lists of articles, publications, resources, etc., produced by authors in the field. We have OPML files, which are lists of feeds. These two things together, RSS and OPML, really make gathering content from all over the internet a lot easier, a lot more manageable. And if you're, if you're teaching, if you're serious about keeping up with whatever field you're interested in, a mechanism, something like this, is really going to work for you. If you don't choose to, do, to use an RSS reader, you will still want to, in some way, systematize a method of collecting information. Maybe you follow Twitter feeds, maybe you uh, read uh, email mailing lists, uh, maybe you just talk to people a lot. But one way or another, the collecting function is going to be a key function of an educator. It's interesting, though, that it is a new and separate role. One of the reasons why I'm pretty well known in the field is because I do a lot of this collecting and then I publish my own newsletter. And so I function in the role of the collector so other people don't have to do that. Another role <coughs> crucial to the teacher as learner is the teacher as connector. This is about you connecting with other people who are in your field, who are either novices in the field or experts in the field. Connection, in fact, is the basis behind the theory of connectivism, which George Siemens and I talk about probably too much. But the idea here is that our knowledge is stored not just in resources, not just books, magazines, publications, articles, books, but knowledge of a field, of a discipline, is stored in the people in that discipline. And so learning in that field is very much a process of connecting, of becoming a part of that community, of interacting with that community. In our open online course, this is one of the things that we stress. We, uh, encourage people to set up Twitter accounts. We encourage people to communicate directly with each other. Pictured here is a product called TweetDeck. It's now owned by Twitter. Twitter itself, if you're not familiar with it, is just twitter.com. It is a site where you can enter short little messages and send them out to all of your followers. If you create a Twitter account, you will typically follow other people so that you receive that their messages. TweetDeck is a way of keeping track of different types of messages sent by different types of people. What happens is, in an online course or even a, an event like this one, people create what's called a hashtag. The hashtag is simply a string of characters following a hash symbol, which is the little, the number, well, it's this. And that's an example of a hashtag. There's a hashtag for this conference, and the hashtag is uh, hash uh, NFF11. Uh, not to be confused with the Nordic Film Festival, which <laughs> this is one of, the, one of the difficulties with hashtags. For our online course, the hashtag is hash change11. 
If you were to do a search on Twitter or on Google for that, for that hashtag, you would find a pile of resources, a pile of people talking to each other about the course. Setting this up and doing this and connecting and talking, communicating and hashtagging is a task in itself. Uh, it's, it's one that I find I don't have enough time to do because I'm so busy being a collector, I don't have so much time to be a connector. That's why it's really useful in our online course to have more than one of us teach the course because, you know, the role of the educator is breaking apart. So George Siemens tends to do a lot more Twittering than I do. I do the occasional Twitter to announce that I'm doing a broadcast and then to announce that the broadcast has failed or some such <coughs> thing. That's a true story, by the way. That, that actually happened <laughs> recently. <laughs> um, so here we have that second very important role. There's a third role. This is a role that Dave Cormier plays a lot in our online course. That's the role of the curator. Because it's not enough to just collect good content. There's a role in appreciating it, assessing it, organizing it, and telling a story with this content. When we think of a curator, usually we think of a person who's in charge of a museum, you know, who does stuff like that, I mean, which is, uh, for those of you listening on audio, I'm now pointing to the window behind me and through that window and a floor below, which is an interesting situation to give a talk from, is an exhibit that has been curated. Uh, and it's an, an exhibit of children's playrooms and toys and blocks and stuff and high things that they can fall from onto the concrete. <laughs> Just, well, it's clearly an exhibit. If it was real, they wouldn't have concrete there, I guess. Uh, but the main thing here is, again, this is a different role than just collecting. With an RSS reader, you collect, well, I subscribe to about a thousand feeds, figure uh, five items on average per feed per day. That's 5,000 items per day. Obviously, there's some sorting and organizing that's going to have to take place. That's the role of the curator. Indeed, with my newsletter, I'm doing as much curating as I am aggregating and collecting because I collect you know, a few thousand things every day, but I only put, you know, five to ten of them in my newsletter. And I do try to organize them and tell the story. In our Change Online course, we also have a newsletter. The newsletter gets published every, every weekday. And again, it's a bit of this collecting, but it's also a bit of curating. It's a bit of bringing stuff together and telling the story. Another role of the student and a, and a role that the teacher has to play is that of the artist. Um, although I, I read just uh, last week, it was one of these you know, 17 signs that your class isn't in the digital age. One of the signs was if you are creating more than your students, you are not yet in the digital age. Creating is something that ought to be done by the learners as much as by the teachers. This is why I really, really like Jim Groom's DS106 course. Jim Groom teaches at uh, Mary Washington University in the US and he has a course called Digital Storytelling. And he decided at the beginning of the year to create, again, a massive open online course, uh, just like we had. But the big difference between his course and our course is that his course emphasized much more the creative act in learning and it resulted in a, in a literal explosion of creativity. The, the internet will never be the same again. DS 106, what he did is he asked the world through Twitter, so his first act was as a connector, right? He asked the world to submit storytelling assignments and the world did. They, they contributed a whole bunch of different types of assignments. One assignment was uh, create, uh, the, create in four icons the story of a movie. Uh, another assignment was create an animation, one of those GIF animations where you, know, you see the GIF image and the okay, but better, um, that 
captures the, the essence of some, uh, some movie or some book or something like that. Uh, I did one for um, uh, Philip Marlowe and uh, his detective stories in 1950s California because I've been listening to them online. I just love those. Anyhow, uh, others were, you know, create a little video, interview somebody on video, and uh, well, anyhow, several hundred of these were contributed. And then he's teaching this class at a university, and he says, well, any, first of all, anybody in the world can come join the class because it is a massive open online course, and that's how they work. And then he told the students in his class, here's a list of assignments that have been suggested. Pick some and do them. And so that's what they did. Because, and that's the other aspect of a massive open online course is that it's not directed. There isn't a central curriculum. There isn't a core body of content that's being taught. The essence of learning in a massive open online course is the participation itself. And so it didn't matter what exercises they did in order to learn storytelling. It didn't matter that they followed some kind of common thread about storytelling. He could have stood up in the front of the room and said, you know, everything begins, you know, and it goes up to a climax. And, but he didn't do that. He had them learn storytelling by doing storytelling, but not just by doing storytelling, but by looking at what each other did in storytelling. Anyhow, this course produced thousands and thousands of artifacts. The people in the course couldn't stop contributing. The people outside the course couldn't stop contributing. And like I say, it sort of mushroomed.